really always like these talking to you and uh, talking about languages our favorite topic and um, of course as always I've decided on a topic to discuss um, it's something that uh, it's normally something that comes up during the week or weeks before the live and um, this time it's really something to do with what I'm doing right now and that is at the moment I'm doing this Estonian language learning challenge which is going to be for the whole month of July and I'm using that and I was sort of looking at uh, speak I spoke to Ott who um, who is the CEO, uh, co-CEO and co-founder of Speakly. And I was listening to one of the podcasts that he produced. And um, he was talking about the education system and how um, that would work, um, which I thought was, was an interesting thing. I'm just um, seeing that I don't think anyone can comment on Okay, I don't think anyone can comment, unfortunately, on YouTube. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'll try and fix it, but unfortunately, it's a bit strange. I'm not sure why that's happening. Okay, but um, I'll put out a test. There we go. So basically, what happened uh, was that it started me thinking about some comments that I'd heard about education systems generally, and. Stu J. Raj is, has always spoken out about some education systems and how um, that sometimes they can be a little outdated and um, and not really do. What we I put a question out there to you all, and the question was, "What do you think of of learning at school? And are they effective with language learning? Do they work?" And you, many of you replied with very varying uh, uh, comments. Some of the comments actually were sort of in line with uh, what Ot was saying and Stuji Raj, and that was that the education system uh, possibly needs uh, some quite serious updating to, to sort of make best use of how to teach languages particularly. And some of you said that it depends on the language and it depends on the country and my my feeling is that there is definitely some of that at play here as well some of you felt that actually schools did quite well with um with teaching how to speak and things or not and some said actually not speaking but the grammar and stuff was drilled so there are a number of different points of view um and my experience with this, having studied in a number of different countries, because I've studied in um, in Scandinavia, I've studied in um, in Northern Europe, in Central Europe, in Eastern Europe, and also in Southern Europe, and there tends to be some tendencies that you see in certain areas of the world, particularly. So um, I'm the kind of person who actually enjoys courses. I, I like being in touch with other people who want to learn, uh, particularly with languages. Languages for me are things that I learn to communicate with and to and to, to actually get across ideas and to in contact. And, and so the idea of going to a class or a group or a study group, as many of you will know, I, I, I don't shy away from those things. In fact, I really, really like uh, getting the chance to to speak with other other learners, and I, I really enjoy that kind of thing. I, I currently I'm, I'm going to study groups for Korean. Um, I also go to classes for uh, Cornish, uh, Scottish Gaelic, and um, and Korean, as well as um, a, a conversation. Uh, well, for me, a conversation type class, learning class for Greek. Um, and then I have other conversation classes that I have with uh, for other languages that I don't get to study while the pandemic's going on that I normally would uh, use more during the year. And and so for me, these these things are, are quite different. And I think when, it, when we talk about education, uh, generally as, as an older learner, somebody going back to that kind of system, I I think that 
Um, one of the things that I have to take into account is that every teacher is going to be different. They'll have different styles, different uh, things that they're interested in. And I always try and look at the strengths that each individual brings to the table. And so to give you an example, I've been studying Cornish for for a, a year, uh, about nine months, roughly eight, nine months. And the same time actually as well for, for Scottish Gaelic. Um, the difference is, is that what we've done in Scottish Gaelic has actually been focused a lot more on the grammar, understanding and exploring the language uh, in terms of the grammatical structures of the language and how it works, and looking at some types of poetry, because sort of the so some of the, the the layers to to that community and, and its language. Whereas with Cornish, it's been very practical in terms of uh, learning to communicate ideas on lots of topics uh, as quickly as possible to join them together and to have conversations. And I've recently just finished my my Cornish language exams, and um, and I, I think I, I mean I expect that I will have passed them. I have no doubt that I won't have passed them because I feel quite confident using the Cornish that I've studied, and I, I, I've been to conversation classes as well, and it's been very very easy to sort of combine all that stuff together. Now with Gaelic, um, if I were to do my Cornish exam in Gaelic, I would I wouldn't stand a chance. Um, all things being equal, the two languages are both Celtic. Okay, Cornish is similar to, more similar to Welsh than, than Gaelic is. So you could argue, okay, it's easier to learn a language that's more similar to one you already speak. Um, but still, it's there's still a process going on there, right? Um, now at school, when I was at school, I, I also noticed that sometimes teachers um, would would find it difficult to speak a language. So if teachers find it difficult to speak, of course, it's going to be hard to teach the pupils in the class how to speak too. So they'll probably focus more on, on their strengths or focus on what their interests are. And I think we can gain things from that. Unfortunately, I think for the language uh, community, which is why I see this divide uh, of, of ideas, is that um, a number of people in the language learning community are there to learn to speak the language. And uh, many of us do that, and that's absolutely fine. And uh, we want to communicate, we want to use language in a, in a very um, active way to talk about what's going on, to talk about our thoughts, our feelings, our ideas, our plans, our hopes, our dreams, all that kind of stuff. And, and so it does make sense that, um, that people would feel disappointed if you're in a system where that wasn't the focus. Um, you wouldn't see the point in it. You'd go to the country, and I get that frustration, right? You go to the country, or you meet somebody else who speaks the language, and they say, oh, you speak the language, and then you kind of don't really know how to actively say very much. It can feel embarrassing, I get it. And, um, and so I, I'm a great believer in being conscious about things that you do uh, and what you can do and what's doable and what's possible. So when it comes to a language, for example, like Gaelic, I'm not disappointed in where I've got with Gaelic, even though my spoken Cornish is, is kind of at a level where I'm not disappointed because what I've explored with my teacher and my teacher are just very different things. And I, it, it's almost like trying to compare apples and oranges, right? They're, um, they're, they're both fruit, <laughs> but they're not the same. I don't know if you can hear my cat trying to communicate with me now on this. Um, he's very vocal. <laughs> Tiger, baby, <laughs> come on. Okay, sweetie. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, he, he, he's, he wants to go out, I think. But um, <laughs> I don't think he knows where he wants to go. So with my um, with with my languages, I'm very conscious that actually, I I, I will have different goals, <laughs> and <laughs> unfortunately, my cat isn't very good at being able to explain to him that I'm doing a live, so I can't <laughs> I can't explain that to him. Um, bless him. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'm still practicing my cat. Um, <laughs> He's super, super cute. He's a really, he's a, sorry, he's a, he's a really cute cat. 
and not just because he's mine, he's I'm obviously I'm, I'm not biased at all. He's very, very cute. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, my, 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 the, the cat, um, well, there are two of them, but my one is the loudest, probably because he's into languages like his dad. I don't know. Um, so, so yeah, this is what I kind of keep in mind is that um, I can't treat any two languages in the same way and I can't treat any two courses in the same way and I can't treat any two teachers in the same way. So I agree with people who say um, maybe there needs to be a change in education and this is why I think that a change in education potentially is necessary. Um, Sometimes in some education systems, we have this tendency to say, we're going to go through chapter one, we're going to go through cha then chapter two, then chapter three, then chapter four, then chapter five, then chapter six, until we get to the end of the book. And once we've been through the chapter, we close that chapter and we open up a new one and we go through it. That's all well and good if you're sort of studying, I don't know, uh, some subjects like history or anything else where you do an exam on a certain thing and you only need to know that thing in isolation potentially for that specific exam. Languages build on knowledge and the very big difference between languages particularly and other subjects is that you can't sort of say well I learned the present tense last uh, on the la in the last chapter and I've sat the exam for that and I've passed it. Now I can forget all about the present tense and move straight onto the past tense or straight onto the future tense or straight onto verb, uh, other verb conjugations or uh, subjunctive mood or the conditional mood or whatever else it is. Um, you know, noun declensions, you can't, you can't do that with languages and sort of forget the rest. Unfortunately, I have seen that that can happen in some school systems that, you will f finish a module and then you move on to the next one. And of course, what languages are about are learning topics, um, learning to express ideas on certain topics and then put them together so that it, it, it all comes together as a whole. And when we talk about language levels and when you improve in a language and people talk about this A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, for my language journey particularly, these are relatively new concepts. Um, talking about the sort of basic, intermediate, and advanced stages in language learning, however you want to put it, these, these are all concepts that we add to things. In actual fact, I don't believe that any of these things strictly exist in the way that we'd like to think they exist. I mean, we, we kind of need these pigeonholes, we need these boundaries to help to describe things they are useful to visualize and see the world, right? They're useful to express, okay, I can do this at this level or um, something else. And, and I get that. And I, I, I think that, I'm not gonna say that we need to get rid of them, but what they can do is, is they, can, they can box us in. And unfortunately in education systems, what happens is you'll tend to, particularly the UK, you will do an exam at 16, which is called your GCSE. So around about an A2 level, um, and then you do an A level, which can take you up to um, B1, B2 ish, uh, roughly, um, and then you can just you study further. The thing is that when you talk about sort of moving up these levels, it makes it sound like you just go one hop, two hops, three hops, four hops, and you're there. And of course, it's not like that at all. They all build on each other, right? So uh, what you learn at A1, A2 continues it's just that you, you it takes longer because you have more vocabulary to learn as you move up the levels but you have to have that solid uh, foundation in place and that foundation takes a little bit of time to to get right and then the the grammar uh, that you've got at some point pretty much stops in language learning you've learned most of what you need to know for grammar by around a to b1 you've learned pretty much the, the, the general nuts and bolts of the language by that time. Um, getting up to maybe B2, you're maybe doing some finishing touches, doing some finishing touches. What you're actually doing is making sure you're getting the grammar right and maybe doing a few, you know, putting a few finishing touches to some things. But what you're actually doing is increasing your vocabulary. And that is actually the most time consuming thing 
because you need to see a lot of stuff to do that. You need to consolidate everything you've learned. You need to make sure that you haven't gone from chapter one, closed it, moved to chapter two, closed it, moved to chapter three, closed it. We're human beings and we forget things. We need to revise things. We need to repeat things. We need to see things over and over again for them to become automatic. And that's what language learning is. And the very best way I've understood language learning to be is uh, a description I saw once in a Teach Yourself book, which said, language learning is overlearning. And what's meant by that is you have seen the grammar structures, you've seen the vocabulary so many times that it's become absolutely normal and automatic for you to just come out with those sentences and to combine them and to put them together and what i'm seeing now when i'm doing this estonian challenge is i come across through speakly in a very natural way words that i will want to use and it introduces them in context so there's this sort of um you know stephen Krashen's um thoughts on this of um you you you, you have comprehensible input things that you will see You've had a little bit of an explanation, a little bit of an introduction to it, and then you'll see a dialogue or something written, a text. And that will have enough of the stuff that you already know for what you're seeing to be comprehensible and for you to start picking up cues in what you're seeing to put together sort of the dots, join the dots together between why is this word now in this form? So for example, um, if I talk about in um, in Estonian, for example, that I'm doing now, so I see the word ehtu. Ehtu is the word for evening. And then I see ehtul with an L at the end. I have to understand that actually there's a difference between these words. And in, in, grammatical, um, in grammatical terms, it's a case change, right? It's a different case. But what I'm not doing is learning it as a case change. I'm learning it as when I use this and when I use that. And sometimes as well in schools, particularly in the south of Europe and the east, uh, central and eastern European countries, there is this tendency to teach grammar, grammar and more grammar, and that's it. And grammar without any context, without any comprehensible input, unfortunately, doesn't really cut it. Um, you need real language that you can use, repeat, and you see the relevance of so that it can become automatic and something you use in turn. And if you don't have that together with maybe some grammatical explanations, you're kind of lost. So I see a number of people go to university um, in countries, uh, in, in some parts of the world where they may study English and their English may be great because English is all over the place. People have it. music, we have lots of films, we have lots of TV shows, we have lots of very popular things. The internet is over 50%, I think, in English still to this day. So really English is difficult to escape, right? So they'll do English and they'll get all of that sort of input outside anyway, naturally. But then give them another language like French, German or something like that, what happens is they learn grammar, but they learn it like it's um, classical Latin or, you know, sort of ancient Greek and not a language that, that many people are able to speak in an active way and certainly not a language that you would be able to buy lots of DVDs and CDs or um, download sound files or you know, talk, have have lots of audio materials where you can listen to the language. It, it's just not um, not not those languages are not conducive to that kind of uh, material, and and it's the same thing if you if you learn a living spoken language that's used actively by communities and you learn it as almost as a dead language. Of course, you're not going to be able to reproduce it, and therefore your ability in it is you get to a point where you come across a, a speaker of the language um, and that speaker tries to talk to you and you've been studying the language for a few years you can't communicate what happens you feel demotivated you feel deflated and you feel 
okay, everything I've done almost feels like it's been in vain and for nothing. And that's not a nice feeling to have as a learner. And so I think for most learners on the whole, when they go home after school, this is very true for school children particularly, the first thing the parents say or their their other loved ones, their families, their friends, is, oh, you're learning German, oh, you're learning Dorin, oh, you're learning Japanese, whatever you're learning. They say, say something. <laughs> How do you say this? How do you say that? And if if the child, or even as an adult, as an adult, you can't say anything, it can feel quite intimidating. And they'll say, well, what on earth are you doing in that class? What on earth are you doing at school? What on earth is your teacher teaching you it doesn't feel like they're teaching you anything um <laughs> sorry my cat is going crazy and i don't understand why he was quiet until i started um well, maybe he thinks he's joining into the stream and he's adding something extremely important that we're not able to translate at the moment if you speak cat please add some subtitles um <laughs> so um what happens is that you you feel that maybe you're even questioning you know your own sanity with the language learning right and i think that what, what probably for the, for the most part of the people in the world it's really important to um to actually communicate and to learn to use the language so i would strongly advocate um courses you know like like on speakly where they're looking to get you understanding and using um, the most commonly used words is, is a pretty solid way of doing it. Um, other courses that do really well with this um, is uh, the Ulpan course that was developed um, when the State of Israel was created. They, they needed to have a language uh, that, that would basically, for, for all the Jewish people coming from all over the world, so that they would all speak. And so the Ulpan course was developed, which would teach you the language in very short a very short space of time. It's actually a normal, I think, a year-long course. And that course to say to express your basic daily needs. And at the end of the course, people tend to do pretty well with it. That course has actually been adopted and adapted um, in Wales and has been used for Welsh and has worked very well as well because it makes the language accessible. It me means that you can start saying things very quickly. So I, I do believe that a school system can learn quite a lot from from these types of courses, from these methodologies, um, making these languages accessible. It could be that we need teachers to go through the courses first <laughs> so that they... Um... <laughs> okay, sweetie, you're doing very well. Thank you. So that they can um, feel confident in teaching these active skills so that not just the children or adults learning the languages feel confident and, and able to, to act, actively use the languages in a real context, but also when they're asked to kind of display their knowledge, they know where to go to straight away um, when they're asked by family and friends when they're at home or in a social environment. So I think that is often, as a learner, one of our nightmares if we can't say almost anything so there are my they're my thoughts on on sort of the education system i think um there's a lot of good in there um there's also a lot of stuff that we can learn from what's going on and how things can be adapted i think that what we've gained from this year of of using zoom and using internet technology to improve our language comprehension to be able to have access to uh, authentic materials, comprehensive materials, to be able to connect with teachers through through platforms like italki, uh, where we can find teachers, uh, find partners uh, online, find study groups, conversation groups, and uh, courses all around the world. I think these are only things that can add and, and benefit us as learners, and in turn, the students in our schools, at universities, and also as adult learners. So that's where I am with it. Um, 
I love it. My dog seems fascinated by the presentation or maybe the cat. <laughs> probably, probably the cat. Yeah, absolutely. I think the cat stole the show today. Um, uh, yeah, his name's Tiger and he's my very uh, lang linguistically gifted uh, feline friend. Um, yeah, so let me see if there are any comments here that I can answer. Um, do I speak English to my cat or Macedonian or, or a different language? Actually, I speak English to him. Um, and my daughter and my wife speak to them in Macedonian. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't speak to them in, in Macedonian. Um, I think because it's my cat, just random cats and dogs on the street and stuff, often I'll use Macedonian because I'm more used to hearing it. Um, or if, <laughs> if, for example, friends have a dog or a cat, then I will. I will use uh, Macedonian, but yeah, normally with 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 my baby, my baby's bilingual, so he speaks English and Macedonian, <laughs> and also cat, so he's trilingual. Okay, um, let me see if I can see. He's asking for my attention. Oh, he he totally wasn't asking for my attention. He's playing a lot with his brother, and he's very vocal. So they've been running around as well like crazy things. Uh, they play. Yeah, it's nice to see some comments about things that we think we need to maybe update things in, in schools. And I, I mean, I've been invited to talk uh, at schools and uh, about schools, actually, on a number of occasions, which I'm very, been very honoured to be asked to do that. And I'm very happy to sort of, um, you know, carry that conversation on, because I think there's a lot we can do. I mean, there are some schools that just do this very, very well and, and turn out really incredible speakers of, of languages. So for some schools, this isn't even an issue. Um, it's, it's just that, you know, when I think on a national level, for example, uh, the country I'm originally from, the UK, um, we tend to have a language for at least five years at school um, for, most, for most children. And at the end of five years, very... Very often, um, the, 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 the children finish school and they don't speak the language. Now, if you were to, they will speak the language. I mean, to be fair, very often it's English that is the second language and they speak it. And I think a lot of it is to do with uh, internet and media, gaming particularly. A lot of children play games and they use English as a lingua franca in the gaming world, but also in a number of other places. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting to see countries that, that struggle and countries that don't. It depends on, on the media as well, what you have on TV, which languages are used on TV as well, uh, which languages are used um, in popular music on the radio, how often other languages will be used, things that you hear all the time, because that's when you understand the relevance. As a child, just to sort of say that children will, for, in terms of communication, children will very often choose the path of least resistance and um, that works for them in pretty much every uh, every situation they will very often use that one language and try to to minimize the use of any other language um, and that's simply because it's the easiest thing to do so uh, that often happens and what happens for a number of English speakers particularly is they'll go abroad on holidays with the parents or somewhere else. Um, what happens when they arrive at the hotel? Oh, you're from the UK or oh, you're from the United States or oh, you're from Canada, or you're from Australia, wherever you're from, uh, and they'll use English. And even with people from other countries, they most commonly uh, studied second language is English. So what children learn from those experiences is everyone learns my language, so therefore, what's the point of doing this French or Spanish or Chinese or German or whatever at school. So the point of learning languages as well has to be addressed for a number of a number of kids at school. And, you know, if you're in France or you're in Italy, uh, typically, yes, you will you will be bombarded with your own language within your country. But as soon as you leave your country, unless you're going to somewhere um, you know, where they will typically speak the language, very often your parents will have to try some English or you'll have to use some of the English you've learned at school. So the relevance and need for English is often there, right? And that's one thing that's, that's particularly English speakers lack. They don't get that, that need, they don't, that urgency to learn the language, unfortunately, which is why I think for sort of on a countrywide level, it's why 
you get a lot of this monolingualism in, in English speaking countries. Um, so you do get that in other countries too. Um, so I mean, if you're in the middle of nowhere in Turkey, for example, everything around you is in Turkish. You don't maybe come across anybody who's speaking another language. So Turkish is on TV, Turkish is lots of music in Turkish. It's such a big country that social media, you can just get the localized, particularly things like TikTok, they show you the people in your country first. So you may never get to anything else except for Turkish. Um, so yeah, it can. It, this plays a big part, I think, in, in, in these kinds of issues. I'm gonna see if I can answer some more of your questions. Um, had English and French at school, and you really can see that English is the main focus of learning, absolutely. Um, here's the grammar at the week, yeah, exactly, grammar Yeah, English is definitely, um, I mean, there's no, there's no question um, uh, that the English. I mean, obviously, for me, it's my, it's, a, it's, it's the language that I spoke at home growing up. So for me, it's very natural to speak English. Uh, but I do recognise that um, for many people who who didn't grow up using English at home, they will often use English as a lingua franca on the internet because they they recognise it too. Um, very quick example: Luca Lampariello is one. Um, Often he does his videos in English, um, uses it a lot on social media. Um, uh, Vlad, Vladimir Skoltetti also, um, I mean, he, he but still, it's recognized as this international language. So, so it's very, you know, these are the messages that you get automatically, right? That these people are learning languages, but yeah, they use English. So the message is always reinforced about English. Um, let me see if I have another question here. It's a good question, actually, list of books. Um, what would you mean for specific languages or language learning in general? Because um, I think language, language books, it would be a very long list. Um, language learning books, I think that, um, again, many, many people who talk about language learning talk about it from their own point of view and obviously because there is kind of a sometimes a desire to shoehorn things because you have a product that you want to sell or you want to do something I, mean, I kind of am a bit different in that way because I'm not selling you a product here yeah, I'm, I'm just talking to you about language learning and having fun um, but it, it can be a bit difficult and I think I'd, uh, depending on what you what you're actually looking for I can see whether I can write a blog post on it uh, let me know, write me a message and let me know. Um, you, you can get a bit lost chasing information with online stuff. Sometimes there's a bit too much, um, too much choice for us. We get a bit spoiled with all the choice. What's my opinion on Anki? Does it work for you? I don't use Anki. My only kind of slight problem with with the, these these apps where you where you memorize words and out of context um, is I mean I think it's good if you use like maybe sentences of things that you've studied right or seen uh, that you want to help commit to memory but sometimes if you're learning just like random words and um, you can get good at learning random words for a quiz uh, does that necessarily help you? with context. Sometimes I think that it can be um, oddly, oddly, oddly difficult to, to then recognize it actively and to use it actively. Um, I'd love to hear any other thoughts on that. Maybe I can talk about that a little bit more actually. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it's a very strange thing. Um, I find that when you see things and you have a story behind something, whether it's context or whether it's a story, it makes it easier to recall vocabulary and to use it in the right way. Uh, sometimes when it's out of context, it can, unless it's kind of the name of a bird or a dog or a, like a dog breed or, or you know, a, an item of food or something that, that you, you know, you just like spices or types of fish or, you know, things that you're not likely to come across in a normal natural context. Sometimes those kinds of things can be handy to learners as lists or, or just separate words. Um, 
but as a general rule i tend not to um to learn things in that way i tend to uh, learn things in a con in context and and i like the stories that you can sort of hang on them onto those those words to create meaning and also to recall things more easily um okay totally agree a1 yeah at the scale yeah it's um the scales are quite it's quite funny the perceptions of scales are actually quite interesting i got a message recently on my Turkish A2 video. Now, and the, the, the comment was, there's no way your Turkish is A2 in this video. It's more like B1 or B2. Um, I found that really interesting because when I made that video many, many years ago, I had only just finished the A2 course. So I didn't actually have any vocab from the, from the level of B1 or grammatical structures. Uh, that I may not have come across at that point. Um, I only had A2 material that I'd studied. And to be fair, I knew almost 100% of that material. And I know I knew almost 100% of that material because I got, I think, something like 96% in the exam. I, 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 I really knew the, the, the material well. Um, and when I made the video, I know that it was just this A2 level. The reply I got back was interesting because it said that for some English exams, apparently, uh, if you get over 80%, then they give you the next level up. And I didn't know that. Um, I knew that in this, there was a Spanish exam, for example, you can do a Spanish exam um, where it, it, it it's an A to B1 test. And if you get a certain percentage in the exam, they give you the B1 level. Uh, so I've heard that before for the exam, but I've not, that wasn't sort of the case for the Turkish. They didn't offer us another level. They just said, you you, you get the B to the A2 certificate, which I got. And <laughs> I'm so sorry, the cat is so funny. He, he's never normally this loud either. I think it's because I'm talking and he, he always interacts with me. So he normally talks to me. He's wandering around, looking at everything and jumping on everything. So <laughs> hopefully he'll come over and say hello in a minute. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting that that was the comment, that was a reply. From my point of view, my experience has been this, that A1 and A2 levels are often, I've done a week or two weeks of a language and now I'm at A2. I'm like That took me months to get to an A2 level. It took me months and months and months. Um, even if I study a language really intensively, it takes me a good a good while to get to that level. It takes quite, a, you know, you're talking 140 plus hours to get to an A2 level, right? Because each level is around about 70, 70 72 hours or something for like an A1 and an A2. And then you have to study on your, on your own as well. So I always find it quite funny. And, and what you can do at A2 is actually quite a lot. You can you can have a pretty decent conversation. If you learn all of the A2 material, you can have a pretty good conversation about a number of things and, and, and mix and match the language in quite a nice way. It's quite it's quite a nice level. Um, and then B1 and B2, um, actually B1 gets some quite specific vocabulary that you wouldn't normally see or hear in day-to-day -day speech. You get things, you know, like we've been doing this in Greek about things at the theater and the different lightings and the scenery and um, the stage and production and all these types of words that yeah, you don't always necessarily use and you won't always necessarily hear or read either um, unless you're reading something about that topic. Uh, so I do sometimes find it quite interesting how we how we perceive these levels. I think it's nice to sort of understand and internalize just what's involved sometimes at an, an A2 level. Uh, I know that for, for Cornish, we've covered a, quite a lot of ground uh, to get to this sort of, it's around about an A2-ish level, I would say, uh, GCSE in UK uh, examination standards, roughly. Um, and now I'll just carry on, but it will, it is interesting to sort of see these questions and hear about them. Um, how many hours would you say uh, for a course per week and then how many how many hours 
would you put in a week to boost your language abilities? Um, so if, if you to just move forward in a language, I always think that you need to do at least have at least two contact hours with the language. That means active learning sessions, whether you're being taught or whether you're learning it um, on your own. And then around that, you would also do uh, sort of revision, learning, uh, contact with the language on a daily basis in between. And for me, that sort of sort of as a standard. If you want to move forward and, and feel that you're moving forward, right? You're not going to go really fast with it, but you're going to move forward. Um, the how long I do is it depends on the language and it depends on um, with Estonian. I'm doing um, I'm doing quite a few hours a day with Estonian. Um, I'm listening listening and listening to several times. Um, the dialogues, the listening exercises, uh, going through new vocabulary, looking at the grammar, looking well, in, in the app, you can look on the grammar, look at the grammar and see a little bit, get a bit of an idea as to how things are formed. Um, looking at new sentences um, for quite a few hours a day and then practicing. And then, so after this live, I've, I've actually got an italki lesson uh, for Estonian. And I'm doing that pretty much every day now, all this, all this month uh, is an Estonian hour of, reading through all of the things that I'm doing during my uh, studies and then playing with the language and practicing kind of a, a more natural use of the language that I've been learning with my teacher and asking asking her questions, she asks me questions, and then I kind of make up as many sentences as I can using the words and the sentences that I've learned and combining them. Um, so that's kind of what I've been doing with Estonian. Um, and there we go. So there we go. That's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. Mm. Okay. A while ago, I was asking about studying at uni uh, in a language that I'm not motivated to improve any further. The language in question. Uh, what are you? What are you learning full time in July? Oh. <laughs> okay. So yeah. The, the, so in Estonian, it's interesting if you're not motivated to study a language, sometimes you've got two options. One, you, you give up, and you, you, you leave the language to one side until maybe your motivation comes back and you pick something you are motivated to learn. The second option is that you you make a concerted effort to refine and rekindle that passion and that love for the language so that you do feel motivated. Um, second option is often pretty good. Um, I, I've had to do that a couple of times and it's amazing how you start meeting people and making friends and uh, making contacts with people who speak the language and use the language that, that sort of really drive you forward and make you want to use it more and more. Um, I know I've had that experience on a number of occasions. Um, okay, let me see. You're trying Estonian, Michelle, fantastic. You're using Speakly too, but just not, um, just to test the app. Uh, yeah, figured why not. Yeah, definitely have a go. It, yeah, I'm glad uh, you've not tried anything like it. No, it's very different. The way it works is very different. Um, it uses vocabulary that you're going to actually hear and use, and it tells you how often you're likely to be able to understand that type of vocabulary. So, so at the end of getting to a certain number of words, it will tell you you've now seen or you've met 170 something words, and that makes up around 20% of all. Um, Estonian daily language that you will likely come across. So it tells you in percentage wise, and you see your percentage grow as you go through the app, which is cool um, because some apps do focus on language that's pretty weird and irrelevant and make sentences that are very strange and you're very unlikely to use, whereas Speakly focuses on sentences you are going to say and you can imagine yourself saying them. Um, or at least swapping out maybe one word, but you can imagine yourself saying all, pretty much all of the sentences uh, that they're going to use. And that's that's a big difference with it. So it focuses on what you need to know and not on what you don't need to know. Um, yeah. The cat meowing would be a very good sentence to learn. At the moment. Um, okay. You talked about languages. Um, not being divisible into separate chapters. Languages are not separate from other subjects. 
and life or in general but teachers don't make the link in my experience yeah you're, you're right Tim uh, Timothy it's 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 true that I mean for other subjects too right I mean I, I mentioned history as you can learn about history and then that's it the thing is is you can type of history you can specialize in a certain type of science specialize in a certain type of many many other subjects you can be a specialist in law you can know about family law you can know about um i don't know any, any you think of it you can sort of specialize in a certain branch right and then you you go down and deep into that one branch and you don't really remember what you have to say and memorize uh for eternity ad infinitum you know whereas with a language you need to have that strong base you can't just say actually you know what I'm going to forget everything about using the language and all the basics. I'm just going to go straight now to um, talking about, I don't know, uh, reading the articles on, on biology. Maybe you might do, right, if you're a biologist, and that might be your goal to learn, to read about biology in German. Maybe. Who knows? But languages generally are subjects that they are cumulative knowledge that grow, that the knowledge grows like this. And you, you arrive at a mass where you can talk about many, many different things and learn about many, many different things because it, it grows as a, as a whole thing. It's like a, its own entity, right? You can't just say, I'm, I'm going to forget about the present tense or the past tense or about how to, I don't know. You, you, can't, you can't do it in the same way with a language and expect it to, to be something you speak. Whereas you may get out of practice in a number of other subjects. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it is a mistake to treat languages like you treat history or other subjects where you can specialize for a specific qualification or sphere of interest. You can hone in on World War II history. You can hone in on, I don't know, ancient Egypt. You can, all of these things you can hone in on, right, for history. And then you may not know as much about the feudal system in the United Kingdom. Uh, you may not know much about um, Native American history in the United States or Canada. You may not know much about other things, but because you focused on one thing, that doesn't necessarily make you a better or worse historian. Um, it's often very good in history, like in languages, to know about things that happened around the world at a similar time to your specialization, so you can see and infer um, uh, things that may have influenced uh, other uh, things that happened, right? So even in even in other things, it is a help. But it, with a language, you cannot actually function speaking the language if you don't remember how to how to actually use the basic stuff. Um, and yeah, that is a mistake. Um, in your estimation, it takes four, three to four years to learn a language similar to English or four to, uh, four to five for a significantly more exotic language. I would say more than the years, I would count the hours actually for language learning and how much time you've put into um, being, for example, you can study a language for, for a year. Uh, like I've, I've, for example, my Gaelic. I studied Gaelic for a year and I'm not even A1. No way, no way. Um, I've studied Cornish for a year, but I've I actually added in going to conversation classes and uh, doing different things in Cornish, and now I'm probably like an A2. Both of them I've studied for one academic year, but the very different levels, very different levels. Uh, Korean I've studied since January. I had a couple of months off, but I studied since January. My Korean is possibly around an A1 level, possibly. Not a very confident A1 level, <laughs> I might add, but possibly around that level. Um, and that's that's been what, well, my, my Korean is better than my, my active Korean would be better than my Gaelic, for example. No, no question. My ability to read a passage in Gaelic and a passage in Korean, probably my Gaelic would be better. Sounds, that sounds, I've just realized that I have to admit that to myself and it's yeah it's quite strange 
because normally for me those those things go hand in hand but actually no i would say that if i were to see a passage in gallic like if i see the the dialogues in my books i can automatically recognize more of the gallic than i can of the korean i would have to think a bit more hard a bit harder on the korean but i could probably come out with more things in, in korean um, if i were to speak it uh, still not going to be very good though <laughs> um if i understand almost everything you're saying 85 to 90 percent and probably in which level is it possible to say that um uh, bruno so um actually in speakly ot says that um so the final level in speakly takes you to about i want to say 90 percent I think it's I think he said that I'd have to look back and, and I think he says in the video I did this interview with him and you can you can check um I think he said 90 percent of, of like all normal language right and um, he says that's around about an, an a, a b2 level um after you've done that um after you've done kind of a2 you're talking about 70 percent of things you hear you can understand and follow and make out what's going on um so really from from the 70 percent to the 90 percent you're filling in details the 90 to the 100 is it can be anything and everything because if you think generally i mean and, and how we base those figures um and, and i assume um uh, that you you're sort of having a similar sort of you've got a similar idea in your head so how he based those figures was on um a total of around I think six, six to nine thousand words or something like that that we'd use um, in normal day-to-day -day speech in any given language. And so if you know around four thousand of those words or so, um, then you're gonna you're gonna be able to do quite a lot. Yeah. Percentages now don't feel quite right to me when I'm saying it out loud, but um, I think in the video he does mention percentages. He I know he said that I think it's about four thousand words or so that you do up to like this B2. And I know that for the A2, it's around 1,200 to 1,500 words, I think, roughly. Um, so you definitely do that hour a day, yeah. Um, yeah, you do it at school. This is the crazy thing is you eat French from a young age. And I was one of the one of the only ones really that really took to it and, and started using it but i used to like write things i used to get my friends to say things in english and i would write in french what they were saying and they were like oh where did you learn that and um, i was like well at school with, with you <laughs> and um but it was yeah it was kind of strange um the, 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 that kind of the yeah and it wasn't the the norm i suppose um when would you start using slang uh like in oh language i don't know language okay um hmm. so slang can often just be something you do from a very a very early age if it's a, a very early age a very early um time in your study just because uh, it's quite natural so um you know uh, depending on what you mean by slang as well right so um uh, sort of colloquial speech yeah, it's something that you might pick up on very, very quickly. Um, you know, to say in, in in French, for example, je ne sais pas, it sounds very bookish. Um, so you say je sais pas, it would be the very, uh, quite a normal way that I would say je sais pas, I don't know, in French. Je ne sais pas, um, be very often, um, you would drop uh, an element of the language and they would run the words together. So speaking in that way is kind of a more natural way of speaking because that's how people interact and use language. Um, and I would, I, I would definitely say that learning to do that is quite good. Um, in the very beginning of language learning, sometimes it can be, um, it can make learning the standard more difficult because you you don't see how the the you know the sort of standard grammar works so for example if i were to teach you uh in in french 
I'm missing out the ne, je ne sais pas. Because in French, you have the double, neg double negation, right? You say ne and pas to not do something. So if I miss that out and just say je sais pas, all you hear is je sais pas, je sais pas, je sais pas. And you miss out the sort of an element of grammar. And as a beginner, if you haven't seen enough of it and all you've heard is that. It's one of the things that um, with Arabic, sort of the, the reason why many teachers teach Arabic is you, t you learn MSA first and then you start learning the, the, various, the various different Arabics around the world is, is that everyone learns MSA as kind of like a Latin for the Arabic world, right, at school. So they all learn that. So if you don't understand a word or you're in a different country where they speak a different form of Arabic, you can always go back to this standard form and you have a word that you can choose, right? That you you can you can both kind of get the meaning of. And so it, it, it helps to sort of do do that. Um so I would I would say that there is a lot of worth i think in sort of a lot of it's, it's, there's definitely a need to to understand how the standard form works so that you can extrapolate uh backwards well go backwards and forwards between the two and understand because sometimes you do need to speak in a more formal way like if i were to walk into a university and say spa in, in french for example or um don't know don't know it, like you can say don't know in english i don't know if i were to use those kinds of forms in in language in a, in a very formal setting. I, I would come across as possibly rude um, and uh, not getting the, the sort of the, the formality levels that I need to have for the language. Um, so I'd be perceived quite, quite differently. So very long answer to a, a question, I know. There we go. Um, it's a nice question and I like it. Thank you. <laughs> um, At what level can you start reading Greek? Particular level, A1, you can start trying it and see how you get on. Um, but I, I think that you try it and you see, and you see what, what works. Um, you can always go back to a book, right? You can always go back to a graded reader. But usually, I mean, I guess A from A2, uh, there are some graded readers that are A1 level, uh, but often they're graded and they are actually uh, labeled A1, A2, B1, B2, etc. cetera, um, at that level. Uh, the A2 otherwise. Normally when you get to kind of a B, B2, B, B2, B, B2 level, really you could probably just read normal literature. You don't need a graded reader at that point. Anyway, I have to jump off because I have my Estonian um, class starting now. Uh, it was lovely to spend time with you again. Thank you for understanding as well that um, we had a birthday yesterday. so. Um, it was a big day for us, and um, I couldn't do the live yesterday, so here I am today instead. And um, I will be back again on Sunday. I look forward to seeing you then uh, at the usual time of 6 p.m. Central European time. Until then, please do write to me. Let me know what you'd like to discuss. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, always a pleasure, and uh, happy language learning. Take care.